Mr. Yeah, I just realized I wasn't recording, so I'm going to do that just for the folks because they have if they don't show up. Yeah, so so let me just point out a little bit about voltage drop only because it could be an issue. Um, so can you guys all see my my whiteboard here? Yes. Okay. So the voltage drop equation, and this is one of the equations that you're going to have to just remember on the test. So right. voltage drop is really Ohm's law. Ohm's law is V equals I uh, times R <laughs> ver. So voltage equals amps times resistance. So voltage drop equals amps. Well, what amp, which amp do we use? Well, in this case, we're typically using the IMP of, of the circuit, which is the real amps, not the ISC, which is the theoretical maximum amps. So we say, okay, voltage drop equals IMP times resistance. Well, when we get the resistance of a wire out of the table in the NEC, it's given to us in ohms per 1,000 feet. Well, I now need to know how many thousands feet. So it's twice the distance divided by a thousand feet. Why twice the distance is because it's a circuit, it's there and back. So in the case of a voltage drop, if I wanted to know, okay, I've got 10 gauge cable. Well, I know that the resistance of 10 gauge cable is 1.24 ohms per 1000 feet. I just happen to remember that you guys don't have to memorize the tables, but you could look it up in the book. I think it's on page 90 something. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you hear the boy screaming? No, no, he's, he's being, he's only annoying you apparently. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, the door is closed, but it. Okay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm just looking in here to see where in the book is is um, the ohms or the voltage drop, sorry, not voltage drop, but the uh, M, uh, resistance characteristics. I know in, in your book somewhere, one of these pages, I thought it was in chapter four. Well, I, I have it. Yeah, you're talking. Oh, are you yeah. talking about the run? How long? How long the drop is? No, no, I'm talking about oh. the table that's on page 84. So, if you have to look up to see what is what is the resistance of a particular cable, um, you know, you would look up on page 84 that table. And in this case. Number 10 stranded copper wire is 1.24 ohms. If I was going with number 12 stranded copper, it'd be 1.98 ohms per 1,000 feet. So I'm just telling you where you would get that number if you needed to look it up. So what's the IMP? Well, you would look at your solar panels and whatever the amps is of one, one panel is going to be the amps for the whole string. Because when you hook up things in series, voltage changes, but the amps remain the same. So if I've got 10 panels hooked up in a string and the IMP is 8.9 um, amps, well, then the string's 8.9 amps. Uh, if I have multiple strings combined, well, then I just combine those amps. You know, So, so let's say each string is 8.9 amps. I've got two of them hooked together in a combiner box then my amps would be two times 8.9 or what's that? 19.8, uh, yeah. something like that. All right, so let's just say it's 8.9 amps. We just looked up on the panel. Well, now we've got two out of the three because we're using number 10 gauge cable. So I looked up that on table on page 84 and then we just measured the distance. So. Let's say we, we're talking about the run that we're doing here at Blue Rock Station. Uh, when Jimmy and I measured it, you know, figuring out how deep it goes, how it does, all the turns, everything like that. Turned out it was 170 feet. So 170 feet times two divided by a thousand. That should be feet there. So then we're going to end up with uh, 
that's going to be 340 divided by 1,000, which is going to be basically 0.34, right? Everybody see how we got there? We measured it. We found it was 170 feet. We have to multiply that times two because it's one circuit there, one circuit back. So the electrons are traveling 340 feet. That is 0.34 of 1,000 feet. So then we just take 8.9. So 8.9 amps times 1.24 ohms for resistance times 0.34 and we get anybody got a calculator i've got one here i think all right 8.9 times 1.24 times 0.34 and i got 3.75 okay and that's going to be volts. Why is it volts? Is because Ohm's law tells us volts equals amps times resistance. So it's 3.75 volts. So what that's telling me is over that run, I'm actually going to lose 3.75 volts. Is that a problem? You know, well, depends that's on how, what the voltage is of the system. Yeah, right? yeah, that's the big issue. If I were dealing with a 12 volt system, you know, like back in the bad old days of solar, right? 12 volts, 3.75 volts. Well, right there, you can see it's a little more than a quarter. It's yeah. going to be somewhere around 30% of my electricity is now lost. Well, that's clearly not acceptable. Um, that's why we have AC electricity is because this is what uh, Edison and Tesla were dealing with back in the early days of electricity. If you ran it and you started your voltage at a low voltage, like you had to do with DC, then you ended up losing it over distance. Um, with AC electricity, they found they could increase the voltage using transformers and uh, increase that volts. So if for instance, this is a 600 volt system, well, 3.75 volts over 600 volts well, now it's 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 less than one percent. You know, it's somewhere around 0.6 percent, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? Well, we want to keep our voltage drop below two percent if we can. So, under this scenario, ten gauge wire is is perfectly fine if it's a six hundred volt system. So, what are your options to reduce voltage drop? Because voltage drop is basically lost money. Um, you can either increase the voltage of your system. You can um, shorten the run. <laughs> shorten the run, yeah. But like here use in a our, bigger wire, right? Yeah, a use a bigger wire. wire. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Normally, you can't really shorten the run because the run is what it's going to be. You know, otherwise you would have designed it shorter to begin with, or you should have. You know, I'm not going to put in an extra 200 feet of wire just because I feel like it. I'm, I'm going to do it because I have to. So economics are going to sort of, you know, dictate I'm going to try and minimize my runs as much as possible. So that's the, um, that's the concept of voltage drop. So Pretty straightforward. Looking at what you just showed right there, I, I think there was a question in chapter four and it, it was saying what percentage of the voltage drop. And you just kind of explained it to me. I'm, I'm assuming what you did was you took our figure that we had and we divided by the total of the, the system. Yeah, the voltage we, of we, the system. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In that particular question, it's saying, you know, if the system was like 90 volts or whatever. You know, if that happened to be what your system was, well, then what is it? And it turned out, I think that one comes in at 17.15% or something like that. Yeah, I was, I was doing it early and I, I didn't know if it was a trick question and it was asking, I was just like, oh man, I'm, I'm lost, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just saying, okay, yeah, you don't know what the percentage is going to be until you know what, how many volts you're losing and what is the voltage of my system. You know, I um, think you changed one up because you asked if we used eight 
gauge wire instead of the 10, what would be the draw? So I was, I mean, I, I wasn't using my book. I was doing it online, so I couldn't refer back. And like I said, it threw me off. And again, you got to read the question several yeah. times. So. Yeah, and part of the reason I did that is I wanted you to be able to, to practice using the table too, to say, oh, okay, well, now I've got a different resistance characteristic. So, so how do I do it? And uh, yeah, there's one question that it says, which is the smallest wire you can get by with to still be under 2%. And that question, you've got to actually try all three of them, you know, and then you find it's, it's the middle one or something like that. So is yeah, that the one that, that whatever button you pushed it, it, it came up wrong. Cause I, I think there was, <laughs> there was one in there and it was just like, you're going to miss one in this quiz. So, Oh, really? Did it, was it? Yeah. If you could let me know, that would be a problem because there should be a correct answer. Um, you know, so I'll go, I'll uh, go through it again, the quiz and double check. I could be wrong. Yep. Okay. But if you're not, let me know. Cause sometimes, you know, there, it could be just that I didn't indicate a correct answer, you know, in the way the, the program is set up, I've got to tell it which one's right. And if I don't tell it one of them's right, then then it thinks they're all wrong. So, yep, that's uh, if for some reason these things don't stay still. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think anything else. I'm trying to anticipate what your issues might be. Um, voltage drop seems to be the issue there a lot. Um, are you guys pretty comfortable with the idea of of the IV curve? You know, volts, the, the, um, well, let me go back into the, into the whiteboard here. Just, I, so the IV curve, sometimes this messes with people is what we're talking about is there's amps and there's volts and standard design here or the standard way a solar panel works is it follows a curve that looks sort of like that. And that is the watts. So the points along this curve, this is the theoretical maximum amperage that that panel could generate under standard test conditions. So this particular point on the curve is known as, I'll let you guys answer that. The maximum, maximum power point. <laughs> No, the, the, the maximum amperage, the, so the theoretical oh, the IMP, the IMP, actually, this is the ISC. ISC. Yeah. The amp short circuit. Be, now you don't want to be operating at the amp short circuit, because if you look here, this is zero. This is the zero point. Any number times zero means I've got zero power. So that is a, something's wrong if it is operating at the ISC, but we use that number because that's the theoretical maximum that the system, that the panel could operate under. So when we design our wire size, we just use that as our amps because that's the max and we want to overbuild the wire structure. Now, the theoretical maximum voltage is down here and that is the VOC, right? So when we're designing our system, you know, the NEC says our system can't be over 600 volts for a residential system. So we're going to use that voltage number as our starting point because it's the theoretical maximum. So these two numbers, ISC and VOC, those are used when we design the system. You know, this is used when we're designing the wire, the ISC, and this is used when we design how many strings, you know, or how many panels in a string so that our voltage doesn't exceed uh, the uh, theoretic, the, the maximum that's allowed by the NEC. I, but, yeah, go ahead. The way this is drawn on the whiteboard right here, could it could you have written could you have drawn it with the V over here and the I down along this line? Just I, I'm for some reason I'm 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 assuming votes could be there and amperage could be down here. Just yeah, it would be just how you would design it. The the curve would look a little bit different, 
Okay. But this is this is the way that the it's done. You know, okay. this is just as a convention. Okay. Um, and then somewhere along this curve is the theoretical maximum amount of power that this panel could generate. And that is the maximum power point. We also sometimes call that the P max. The terms are slightly different, but they mean the same thing. And, and then there is a voltage associated with that point. And that is the V max or the VMP, same, same issue. And then there's an amperage associated with that. And that is the I max or the IMP. I wish they'd standardize those terms, but they, they have it. So this is your operating amperage and this is your operating voltage. Um, there's there's a device known as the maximum PowerPoint tracking device, the M MPPT, that is constantly adjusting within the inverter, typically, or in the charge controller for a standalone system. I was going to say that's the more expensive um, charge controller, right? Yeah, well, they call it an MPPT, but it's, yeah, that's really a, what's referred to or should be referred to as a buck boost charge controller. Pretty much every pulse width modulating charge controller has a MPPT in it. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in a second, but I don't want to confuse this just yet. Um, okay, so these are your operating voltages and amperage. And the MPPT is constantly adjusting based on conditions. So if the temperature goes up, then the curve is going to move. Remember, as temperature rises, temperature mostly affects volts. So we're going to get a curve that suddenly looks more like that, only it'll be curved rather than jagged or whatever. Well, the MPPT is moved now too, you know, because now it's over here. So everything has to be readjusted to, to operate at the peak performance. So the VMAX has to shift, the IMP has to shift. Um, well, that's what the MPPD does. It's constantly monitoring conditions and adjusting accordingly. And it does it, you know, on a microsecond kind of scale where it's constantly keeping you operating. Regardless of what the condition is, you will get the most power you can get out of the panel you know, under those conditions. Uh, there's only one time when everything's operating at standard test conditions. Uh, you know, that is if it just so happens that it's exactly 25 degrees Celsius and there's exactly a thousand watts per square meter, which happens almost <laughs> never, you know, I mean, but that's how we measure the panels. That's what standard test conditions says. So in reality, our curves, we have an infinite number of IV curves and it's changing based on a cloud passes over the sun and suddenly it's in a different place. You know, the temperature changes and suddenly it's in a different place. So, so that MPPT is a pretty clever little device that's constantly keeping the panel operating at its maximum power point. Um, that's a good thing. Um, but uh, that's those are the five points on the curve that you need to be aware of. The ISC, the IMP, the VMOC, and the VMP, and then the maximum power point. Now, the solar panel manufacturer will give you those numbers. You don't have to calculate them. They'll just be given to you. And, and it's different for every, every um, panel. So... Uh, now, you talked about um, the uh, MPPT charge controller, and the MPPT charge controller is um, a brand or it's a marketing ploy, basically. Um, it's they call it that, but really what it is is a buck boost charge controller. It basically means that. Um, Power can come into the charge controller at one voltage 
and is then converted to a different voltage when it leaves. Um, so it's a DC to DC voltage converter that's built into the charge controller. So um, the reason why that's a good thing, and I'm relying on my whiteboard here, but uh, let me let me draw you a picture. Um, let's say that we've got a standard standalone system. So we've got a solar array here. It's going into a combiner box or a junction box. We're going to go to a DC disconnect. And then from that DC disconnect, we're going to connect to a charge controller. From the charge controller, we're going to connect into our battery bank. From the battery bank now, well, there should be a DC disconnect of some sort here, and then go into the inverter, right? And then from the inverter, we're going to go into our, our main disconnect and then our load distribution. So this is a pretty standard, basic, um, standalone system. Well, what, you know, we just pointed out that voltage drop is an issue, but wire size is a big issue too, based on the number of amps. And if I had, let's say I had, uh, this system and it's, I'm going to do these real quick so that they won't be exact, but let's say I have a 2000 watt array. And it turns out that in order to, uh, and my system here is a 48 volt battery. So under a standard um, standalone system, I would need to have a 48 volt inverter to work with it. I would need to have a 48 volt charge controller. And then I would need to have a 48 volt array. So everything needs to be compatible. And the thing that drives it is the battery, right? Everything's got to be compatible with the battery bank. Is that clear so far? Okay, so if I had a 2000 watt array and I put in a 48 volt system, how many amps do I have? Well, 2000 divided by 48 gives me 41.67. So I need 41.67 amps, but I need to multiply that times 1.25, which is the NEC safety factor. And then I need to multiply it times 1.25, which is the solar variability factor. And now I need times 1.25 times 1.25. So now I'm up to 65 0.1 amps. So if I look in the book on page, same one system. Yeah. No, this is uh, this is amps. So in the book on page 104, I want to know what size wire I need to handle 65.1 amps, and I'm going to need four wow. gauge wire, right? Everybody clear on that? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading from, from column one there. Yeah, I, I, was, I was trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the reason the reason I'm reading from column column one is because not only the wire has to be compatible. But the right. termination connections for both right. pieces of equipment, right. and I don't know what they are. So I'm just going to assume they're at the lowest temperature mm -hmm. rating. So because they may change too, you know, I mean, in the future or whatever. So we're always going to read from column one when we're designing these things. So I need yeah. four gauge wire here. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. And, and four gauge wire is pretty expensive you know, relatively expensive. I don't know. Jimmy, how much does four gauge wire cost a foot? <laughs> uh, it's probably, I don't know, maybe 40 cents. 
34 oh, cents. Oh, no, no. Four gauge? It'd be more four than that. Wire. Oh, four gauge. Uh, I really don't know. Honestly, let's say it's, know. let's just say it's a buck a foot, right? Uh, which pro probably is about right. Um, okay, so I'm coming in here now to the charge controller. I have to pull four gauge wire. Well, wouldn't it be nice if I could go and, and if I could change this to a 600 volt system, well, then what, what gauge wire could I get by if this was 600 volts? Well, now it's only going to be like three amps, um, you know, 3.33 amps times 1.25 times 1.25. I mean, that's going to get me in the neighborhood of six or seven amps. Um, well, I could go with 12 gauge wire, no problem. And, and now that's going to save me a few hundred dollars for sure. You know, just based on, on the cost of wire, 12 gauge versus four gauge. So what I'm doing here is if I go with an MPPT charge controller, the voltage can come in at 600 volts, but it leaves at 48 volts. That's what an MPPT charge controller does. <laughs> it's really a DC to DC voltage converter. You got to have a charge controller on a standalone system. So yeah. On the standalone system, you need a charge controller. On a grid tied system, there are no batteries. You don't need the charge controller. Um, you know, it, it's going straight to the inverter. Jay, when you wrote um 41.67 amps and you said 1.25 what what is that nec yeah that says nec there and what was um, the la this last you said solar what yeah okay well let me let me stop yeah the difference the when we're sizing the ampacity for a wire we take whatever the ampacity is we for all wire, the National Electrical Code says you've got to multiply it times 1.25 because of it's their safety margin. You know, they say, all right, we want you to overbuild the infrastructure because otherwise, you know, the we just want it to be safe. If you put too many amps on a wire, it can burst into flames, the house can burn down, somebody can die. So let's put a, a safety margin. And over the years, they've decided. 1.25 is the amount that they're going to multiply. So whatever amps you think is going to be on that thing, multiply it times 1.25 and design the system to that size. But solar is variable in nature. Um, you know, we, we've based standard test conditions on a thousand watts per square meter, right? Yeah. But I've gotten measurements out in the field at around 1200 Watts per square meter, you know, cause, cause a thousand Watts is just what we think it is when there's no clouds in the sky. But if you have a nice clear day, you know, at the outside edge of the earth's atmosphere, it's actually 1360 Watts per square meter. That's what the solar constant is. So it, if it's just a really clear day, the number can be higher. So they say, all right, the 1.25 is for any kind of wire, but for solar, because solar is, we don't know, it's variable. Let's multiply that by a second 1.25 safety margin. So we call that the solar safety margin. You only have to do that before you get to the first piece of electronics that begins to control the system. So in this case, the charge controller, from that point forward, the voltage is going to be controlled by the charge controller, whether the conditions of the sun's energy change or not. This charge controller is going to limit it, you know, to, to a certain output. So only in the part before the first electronic device do we have to put that second voltage uh, adjust or that ampacity adjustment um, for solar, for the variability of solar. In, in a lot of today's market, when we put solar up on, on the roof, let's say I've got a solar panel and I've hooked a little microinverter right to it, directly between, 
Well, now all my wiring from that point forward, I don't have to worry about that second adjustment because the microinverter is controlling the system. So variability of sunlight is dealt with within the microinverter. So, so that it's important to remember, it's once you hit the first piece of electronics that controls the system, before that, you got to put in the second 1.25. After that, you still have to put in the 1.25 safety margin that the National Electrical Code requires on everything. Um, you know, so uh, for example, in a, in a traditional um, electrical system, if I've got a circuit breaker box here with my main and I've got a 20 amp breaker here, well, what size wire can I hook up to that? You know, 20, it's 12, right? Or, 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 or. Yeah, you would do typically a 12, but what what you're gonna say is the 12 gauge wire has an ampacity rating. In this case, according to the book here, it's got 25 amps. Which is the first, yeah. For uh ampacity rating. But how many amps can I run over that circuit? You know, what does the NEC say that I'm allowed to actually run through that circuit? And it turns out I can't run more than 16 amps over that circuit because my breaker has to have a 20% capacity overage. So if I, if I divided 20 amps by 16, that should end up being 1.25, right? 20 divided by yeah just about 16 yeah 1.25 so so what they're saying is okay even though the the wire can handle more um i'm only allowed to run 16 because that gives me this 1.25 safety margin yeah okay that hopefully you'll i mean this will become more and more clear as you're doing sizing from from an inverter and things like that. In fact, um, let's see. I'll I'll. Uh, I don't know that this has a way I can clear all of them. But let's say, for example, I don't know if it's in this chapter or not. But one of the things that we talk about, which can be a little bit confusing for folks, is one of the questions is it poses the question. Okay, I've got a service panel here and I've got 100 amp service from the grid. So this is my electric meter. <laughs> and the panel box itself is rated for 100 amps. So the question is, what size inverter can I hook up from my solar array? So this is all going off to my solar array. So this is the inverter. Well, can I hook up a solar array to this in this scenario? So the the size of the bus bar is rated at 100 amps. And I've got 100 amps coming in from the utility. So you might just say, listen, it's already at its capacity. I can't do anything more. But the NEC says... No, we're allowed 120% of whatever this rating is under this scenario, because they argue that um, you almost never use all of the available power. So I, I can go to 120%. So that means I can put a 20 amp fuse there or breaker. Right, because right. twenty amps plus a hundred amps equals one hundred and twenty percent of the hundred amp rating. Everybody clear so far? Mm. All right. Yeah. So, what size inverter can I now hook up to that twenty amp circuit? Well, if there was no safety margin, I know that the power coming out of here is going to be two hundred and forty volts because that's what the power coming in 
to my uh, boxes from the grid. And the inverter has to match the voltage exactly of whatever it's sending out to the grid. This is on a grid tied system. So the output from my inverter is going to be 240 volts. Well, watts equals amps times volts. So I could say 240 volts times 20 amps is going to give me 4,800 watts. So I could put a 4,800 watt inverter if there was no safety margin. Right? Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. But because there is a safety margin in the wire, I've got to now take this and divide it by 1.25. That's the NEC safety margin. So 4,800 divided by 1.25 gives me 3.84 or 3,840 watts or 3.84 kilowatts. So it turns out the biggest inverter I could put here is a 3.84 kW inverter under this scenario because of the safety margin. So if you look online, you're going to find that a lot of manufacturers make a 3.8 kW inverter. And they also make a 7.6 kW inverter. Well, that seems weird, except once you figure out that with a 100 amp service with a 100 amp panel, which is pretty common, I need a 3.84 kW. So why don't I just make that? Well, what's the other most common scenario? I've got a 200 watt or 200 amp service from the utility and a 200 amp panel. Well, then I would use a 7.6 kW inverter. So the manufacturers have just simply designed their systems to meet these common scenarios. Everybody clear on that? I hope I'm not confusing you more. Yeah. You All of this can be confusing. Ask questions if you go. Yep. I'm throwing a lot of stuff out here, but you've got the videos that you can review. Oh, yeah. And, so, and, and all this here is chapter six that you just went through, right? Oh, I, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, well, that's good. Well, now well, you're jumping ahead. Hey, hey you Randy, say, you, Randy? Don't have, you don't have any questions uh, from, from chapters four and five. I'm going to make you have some questions. I from chapter say, six. Was, I'm like, I know I didn't cover this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 you didn't cover it either, Randy? No, I was like... <laughs> Oh, okay. It like I knew what was going on for a minute. Yeah, I'm <laughs> like, it, it sounds a little familiar. I was looking through the books, but I'm like, I mean, I got an idea, but I just knew I ain't seen videos on it yet. I'm like, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> okay. I thought I was the only one. I'm like, okay. <laughs> nope. Well, that's good. See, you're going to know so much stuff, but now you understand why I'm talking about that kind of thing. Cause yeah. they do have real world applications. You know, it's like, uh, I need to make sure my inverter doesn't exceed the capacity of the wire. You know, I'm limited by how much I can put into the service panel box because of the impacity rating of the bus bar. So everything affects everything else. So uh, I'll just be, we'll, we'll bring this up to an end here before I completely blow your minds. But, uh, um, <laughs> you know, you just know there's a lot of stuff here. Not, not any one part of it is, is hard, I don't think. Dollar thirteen a foot, just just piping. Oh, a, a buck thirteen a foot for the, yeah. for the four gauge, yeah. Yeah, so, right. but, yeah. So make it small. Price? Yeah, that's a price. So uh, that, keep the wire small. Is that good or bad? Oh, it's all bad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know the prices are way too expensive. But okay. uh, yeah, so you want to keep your wire. You know, you want to minimize the size of the wire. How do we minimize the size of the wire? Well, increase the voltage of the system. That's typically the best way you can do that. It makes sense, uh, but Jay, what happened to your universal law, like uh, universal law of and just use number ten? That way, you yeah, don't. don't to... Yeah, that I was going to get to that. My my rule, Jay's rule, is uh, don't use any wire smaller than ten gauge in in designing your system. 
And if you look at the difference between 12 gauge and 10 gauge, not that much compared to the overall cost of the system. Um, but, um, you know, it may be, yeah, it's going to be some dollars, but you'll, you'll oftentimes forget something, you know, you'll forget to add in some sort of safety factor or whatever. And then suddenly 10 gauge has saved your, saved your butt. So, um, you know, it's, it's just better to be safe. You never get in trouble putting in bigger wire. Um, you only get in trouble when you're putting in smaller wire than you need. So 10 gauge is my minimum, you know, let's not go below that. Um, okay. So that's, that's, that's enough for today. We'll, uh, we won't blow your mind, but yeah. So next week we'll be getting into chapter six. Um, if you have questions through the week, don't hesitate to send me an email uh, but store up your questions if you can. And, and then next, next Tuesday, we'll, we'll cover whatever questions arise. Uh, especially, I, I don't think Lawrence is shy about asking questions, but Randy, you need not to be shy. Uh, and they were I thought, actually I thought Randy to... knew it all. So I, I was uh, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just cause you're quiet doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, what's going on. So well, I'll tell you um, what, well, when I, I, I watched I watched um, your other session on YouTube a little bit about that about chapter five and six a few days ago, but I'm gonna read chapter six and get through it, and then I'm sure I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> okay, and were you on Solar Noon Tuesday uh, today? I caught the last end of it. I was trying to get the boys situated, so yeah, I caught the okay. last end of it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna watch that again as well. So. Yeah, okay. Reading. All right. Any other questions before we call it a day? Nope. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Right, bye-bye.